Happy Monday. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I had just I had a little burp that had to come out. You must have a little stomach acid. And a little stomach. Well, I also ate way too fast. I was going to say. I was so hungry. There was an Instagram video that I saw the other day, and I thought about recreating it, and I was like, I just got bored watching this. It's a girl just sitting there chewing, <laughs> and mm. she was explaining, which I totally uh, appreciate, and is very valid. You need to sit and chew. It was all about if you're out to dinner with someone, and they're asking you a question, you know. While you're chewing. While you're chewing. She'll just, you know, politely tell them one second so she can finish chewing 20 to 30 times before she swallows. It's really hard. It is very hard. Mm -hmm. I totally understand the benefits and agree with the benefits. Do I apply that? Not always. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I've been much better at dinner time because we've Mm -hmm. been sitting down as a family. Um, As you witnessed this morning, my schedule just went chaotic at 8.15. And so I was like running down. I had eight minutes between calls. I'm like... Art had made me some eggs and uh, like standing there eating my eggs and then putting um, my gluten-free waffles in the <laughs> air fryer, go back to another call, come back, eat some gluten-free waffles. Yeah. So that's the chaos. best. Uh, by the way, if you guys don't know, how you eat is really, really important. Mm-hmm. So um, you can see my Instagram for some tips there because all of that is going to impact what we're talking about today, which is the hormonal cascade. Yes. And speaking of trying to eat dinner as a family, I really tried. So the day after daylight savings, oh lord, I really, really tried to be like Nick. When you get home from your golf event, like let's try and eat dinner together. I feel like we haven't eaten dinner with the kids in forever because it's just chaos in our house from like the moment we get home with the kids until they go to bed. So we usually wait until after they're in bed to eat, which I hate because we're not eating until like eight thirty a lot of nights. And so I was like in the kitchen trying to like put food together. It's 5 p.m. The kids usually eat around 6, 6 6.15. Carson comes in the kitchen. He's like, mom, I'm hungry. I want to eat. I want to eat dinner. And he like never tells us that he wants to eat dinner. So I'm like, he's probably actually hungry right now. Taylor's like screaming her head off. I was like, she's probably hungry. And so I was like, fine, fine. We'll eat separately again. (laughs) I'll make them their own food. We'll eat separately. (laughs) So it's so funny that you bring this up because yesterday we get home from school and I picked Marcus up just a little bit early and Art's like browsing around the kitchen at 5.30 wondering why I'm not making dinner yet. I'm like, because it's 5.30. Like, it's, uh. it's fine. On the way home, we talked about Marcus has been on a vegetable kick lately. I'm so jealous. Since Halloween, I got that veggie tray, man. He was like, give me some broccoli, give me some carrots. Aunt Rachel brought him watermelon, broccoli, and carrots on Saturday. So on the way home from school, he was telling me that's what he wanted. And I said, perfect, because you usually always want candy or ice cream. And so we had the conversation of tonight we're going to have your healthy snacks and then we'll have dinner and then you can have something after. And then of course I forgot that I told him that. And after bath and everything, I'm like, no, you can't have ice cream 20 minutes before bed. We can't do this. But mom, you told me I could. Um, so it's just so funny because I feel like with the daylight savings time, I mean, I thought it was like midnight at seven 30, know. Know. you know, you do just feel so discombobulated. So yeah, art was yeah. like hangry at five 30 and I was like, what's going on? Like, it's not even time to make dinner yet, but we also had, um, one of the ways that my daughter is manipulative at the age of 15 months. Um, we had Carson's like candy basket on the kitchen table for a little bit. And I was looking in it and I, while Taylor was eating dinner, I was sitting next to her and I took something out and she saw it and started literally screaming her head off. And then I gave her a bite and she stopped crying. Mm. And then I put it away and she started screaming her head off again. And I was like, Nope, I'm not, I'm not giving into this. And she is just sitting there throwing her food that she was supposed to be eating dinner with. And I was like, oh my gosh, one, you are so aware of like what this is and that you mm-hmm. want it. Cause I gave her half of a Kit Kat on Halloween, mm-hmm. which she loved. And now she correlates like that. She it's knows like, what it looks like. Oh my it's God. Like crack. Kids are so crazy. I mean, but also sugar is like crack. It Let's is. be honest. Like I had a couple Starburst and some, I love the, like, yeah, you guys know, I've told this before about the Twizzlers. So a couple of houses gave away Twizzlers. So I kept three of my Twizzler packs for myself. And I was actually looking for one the other day. And Art goes, he ate your last Twizzler pack. I'm like, what the heck? This I get myself like the tiniest dose of it here and there. But um, um, as much as we talk, I mean, it, I really did. We fell, followed through and true yeah. to our goal for Halloween. And um, I actually think they might still be in the garage. We should put them in the garage We have tomorrow. so much candy in our pantry right now. Yeah. And what I sometimes will do is I'll go and I will take a bite of one thing and then I'll throw it in the garbage and I'll do that throughout the week. And then I've gotten rid of a lot of candy that way. (laughs) (laughs) One bite of a mini Twix. 
<laughs> That's what I do. So it's like half of them need to drink. Exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, we got to talk about hormones today. Oh my goodness. So we Wait, a, yes. hold on a second. You guys, there's a podcast coming out this Friday where- You found the lemon juice thing. <laughs> we are going to rant on the belly button. It's the belly button. It's on Art's TikTok. So this is how the algorithm is so crazy. It's on my TikTok now. Excuse oh, me, Art's showing my TikTok. So I posted, if you guys follow me on Instagram, I posted the day that we're recording this, is which is Tuesday, six days prior to this going up, about the gimmicks and this belly button thing that looks like a little piece of a turd that apparently you you literally, it's a little ball, Shove you put it, it in into your belly, belly button. button. What if you have an Audi? I, I mean, then you're screwed. It's not going to work. You're going to be fat forever. It. So now my TikTok is sending me ads for the belly button um, weight loss pill, oh whatever this thing okay. is. So right, let's dive speaking in. Speaking of hormones. <laughs> um, so we wanted to talk a little bit today and hopefully we keep this high level and understanding to you guys to help comprehend hormones a little bit better. Because I think so many people think of hormones in a silo, like you think of them in their own little space. And you don't think about the fact of how many other enzymatic functions and chemical processes within the body affect our hormones. And so we want to kind of break down a little bit, give some examples today, like what are hormones? How do that? How does that get impacted by our choices and what we consume? You know, in terms of skincare products, hair care products, food. And then also how upstream and downstream in the body affect your hormones. Because a lot of people claim to have hormonal imbalance. And although that is a real thing, hormones in and of themselves are rarely the main issue. And so a lot of people go to HRT or hormone replacement therapy, or they take things to help with their hormones like chastberry or, you know, these different types of herbs and supplements. When in reality, we, 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 that's not the solution. Like you are probably, if you are not detoxing or metabolizing your hormones properly, taking hormone replacement therapy isn't really going to help a whole lot. And it might things make, make things worse. So we want to kind of talk about that today, um, hopefully help understand this concept better and why you have so much control over it. Yep. And I remember when we were doing a mentorship with one of our, um, unfortunately he passed away, but uh, previous mentors, I remember him talking about this. If you guys can imagine just like a spider web, right? Everything is so interconnected inside this web and you pull on one way, things break down or they don't get connected in the way that they're supposed to be in this spider web. And so that's what we want when we're talking about enzymatic functions and how things are cofactors. It basically re means that the body relies on one thing for, or multiple things for one other thing to function optimally. Okay. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today in terms of, and you can even think about this in a domino effect, however you want to think here. But if you don't understand what we're saying with the cofactors or the enzymatic functions, it's all interconnected. So what are hormones? Hormones are like chemical messengers. Okay. So you can think of them as a male delivery service. One gland will write a letter to another gland. So they take a hormone, essentially that's the letter and they put it into an envelope and they send it to another gland. And that other gland has a receptor site. Also can think of this as like a lock and a key, but that letter lands on the receptor site. Okay. So it's a key trying to come in. Um, and if it's possible, it will read that letter or unlock the code. Okay. And then it's also going to send a letter back. So almost think about pen, when you were pen pals when you were little kids, <laughs> right? You're sending letters back and forth. And this is what a lot of people know about in terms of the negative feedback loop. Okay. So if we have sex hormones, we have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, glucagon, DHEA, all of these are a form of lipid hormones, which are kind of like the end product of hormones. So for example, estrogen is an end product. There's a lot of chemical interactions that have, have to occur for estrogen to finally be created or made. And then more processes that have to happen after that, um, it is even used up by the body. It's been metabolized by the body, done its job for it to be deto detoxified essentially and removed. So any excess or metabolized hormone that's left over needs to be excreted from the body. And there's dozens of ways that this happens. Yeah. So a lot of things that impact like this end product hormone, testosterone, sex hormone, whatever it may be being made 
are your lifestyle choices, what you eat, what you drink, what you consume, don't consume, exercise, sleep, stress, and they all play a role in the end products or what is you know essentially your hormone levels, like you get blood hormone levels tested. That is what you're seeing. And so unfortunately, that is why we simply cannot just add hormones because we're basically like, I'm just going to skip all these other things that could be going awry and just give myself hormones and hope that that fixes things. And it might help some symptoms, but it's not addressing the fact of why are the hormones imbalanced in the first place. And we also need to evaluate those receptor sites that Liz was talking about that like lock to the key because a lot of times that can be a the part of the problem or the problem as to why these messages aren't even getting to where they're supposed to be getting. So I wanted to give some examples here to hopefully help you guys understand this. So I'm gonna talk about estrogen and I'm gonna talk about cortisol. Estrogen is obviously a female dominant hormone, males created as well, but there are things in our world called endocrine disrupting hormones, BPA, heavy metals, pesticides. We've talked about them before, a lot before. Even low doses of those can be unsafe. The body's normal endocrine functioning um, involves very small changes in hormone levels, yet we know even these small changes can cause basically long-term developmental and biological effects. And so we, when we have these like, Again, something we've talked about before, estrogen mimicking chemicals or toxins, specifically like phthalates, BPA, parabens. When we have high amounts of these, they're known as xenoestrogens. They have the ability to bind to those estrogen receptor sites, things that should be open for our body's natural hormones to be going into. So not only can they mimic our natural hormones, but they can block other hormones from binding to those receptor sites. And while the xenoestrogens are occupying the body, the body is still creating its own andro- endogenous estrogen. Like it's creating its own estrogen. So now we have excessive amounts of estrogen circulating in the body and many excess estrogen is being stored in fat cells. Um, and this is the confu- this is essentially like very confusing to the body as it's not able to metabolize and excrete the overabundance of estrogen quick enough to keep up with the rate of exposure. This is where we run into estrogen dominance frequently. There are other factors that play a role in estrogen dominance and like that being a result of what's going on in the body, but this is a big contributor. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, we've talked a little bit on other podcasts about evaluating what is your load of all of these toxins, right? How often are you microwaving plastics to warm up your lunch at work or eating frozen meals that are coming in plastic? I actually um, thought about that several months back now when I think I ordered um, from, you know, it wasn't Mm -hmm. Factor, but it was one of the meal delivery services. Like I should be taking this out and putting into a glass dish even to warm that up. Or great example, last night when I took out um, the Kevin's frozen sweet potatoes that I had gotten. Okay. I don't want to warm it up in here. So I took it out of the packaging entirely, put it in my glass dish, put it in the oven. It's fine. But then you have to think about too, your receipts, receipts combined with hand sanitizer recipe for disaster. Mm. I mean, so think about all of these things. How much are you drinking out of, you know, plastic water bottles, even if it's, you know, in one, on one hand, it's good that you're drinking purified filtered water. Right. But Think about where that plastic has been in terms of heat in transportation, right? So as it gets warm, even though it says it's BPA free, there's other toxins in that plastic that are seeping then into your water again, or if you're microwaving things into your food and things like that. And so think about your toxic load, all of these things that we're exposing ourselves to every day, simple Google search will give you a much longer Mm -hmm. list of xenoestrogens, especially if you are a female, I think it's really important that you you know, educate yourself and become aware of this. And I think um, Natural Minded Mama on Instagram, she's got a bunch of different like images where you can look at like the swaps um, mm-hmm. because this is really, really important. So yep. you want to talk about cortisol? Yeah. Here? So next one is cortisol. And I think a lot of people can, th- I'm hoping that this makes some sense for people. So the amount of cortisol produced and the amount of free cortisol available can be very different in certain scenarios. So when we run what's called a Dutch test on clients, which is a sex hormone and cortisol hormone kind of functioning test and metabolizing test, what we see is it gives us both metabolized cortisol and free cortisol. So how are these different? Metabolized cortisol is what your body is actually making. Free cortisol is what your body is able to use. And these do not always match up. Actually, frequently we see these not match up. And that's why both both of them are measured because they allow you to see how are you clearing or metabolizing and at what rate is that cortisol being cleared and metabolized. So for example, 
higher levels of metabolized cortisol, so for example, like your body's making a lot of cortisol, are often actually seen in obesity where adipose tissue or fat tissue is likely pulling cortisol from its binding protein and allowing for metabolism metabolism and clearance. Or a lot of times we'll see this with high amounts of inflammation in the body. You clear cortisol faster. So your body's making cortisol, but you're exhausted. Why? Because your body's clearing that cortisol so fast so that you don't even have the chance to use the benefit of what cortisol is. Cortisol is needed to be there. When you have flatlined cortisol, you basically can't get out of bed. Like that is that is not a situation you want to be in. And so that's why we look at these tests because we're like, hey, you have no problem making cortisol. Your body's just clearing it too fast. The adrenal gland also has to keep up with this cortisol kind of sequestering and excretion. So cortisol production is often quite high, even though Free cortisol does not correlate positively with adipose tissue or your BMI. This insight's really helpful for those people looking to lose the belly fat and suspect cortisol or stress is kind of a major factor. Um, and these people are often misdiagnosed as having low cortisol production. When you have symptoms like, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I'm doing all these things, and you try to supplement with you know adaptogens that are giving your body more cortisol, we're running into a problem now, right? Your body has no problem making it. You're just clearing it too fast. So we need to understand how to extend. Sometimes licorice root is great for this, but you have to be careful with staying on that for too long. And if people have heart conditions, you can't take it. There's other you know, supplements we will sometimes use to help people support their stress resiliency and allow them to kind of calm down to where they can use this cortisol. And then, for example, if people have low thyroid or hypothyroid, the opposite pattern is often seen. And when the thyroid slows down, or you have hypothyroidism where free T3 cannot get into the cells. And we know that T3 is that active form of thyroid. The clearance, like I just talked about, of cortisol through the liver actually slows down. So as a result, free cortisol starts to increase and may show up as elevated cortisol on the Dutch test. So this is where, again, it is not just the levels of cortisol that you're looking at. You need to understand that downstream and upstream, there's so many different things playing a role in terms of, okay, I have low cortisol or I'm tired. I should supplement to increase my cortisol. No, maybe you have good levels of cortisol production. Your body is just not using that cortisol very well. So hopefully that kind of makes sense as to why we cannot just look at these numbers at face value. Yeah. And we have to ask why is this happening? Like what's blocking my lock from the key entering and unlocking it, those, those receptor sites, right? To accepting that hormone. Like, and I think about myself with, you know, over the years looking at my thyroid levels and wondering why is my free T3, even when I'm medicated, still low. So now I've gone off my medication and TSH is fine. My free T4 didn't change at all. And honestly, my free T3 didn't. So I'm doing other things right now actually to work on antibodies to distract them from attacking the thyroid. And I'm working on my gut and my liver because 70% of the conversion of T4 to T3 happens in the liver, 20% of it happens in your gut. And so when you're asking the question why, then we're looking upstream or downstream. And that's kind of what we want to talk about because as Becca mentioned, like just looking at blood levels of these hormones may or may not give you the answer. And so that's why I do like the Dutch because it's mm -hmm. such a complete view, especially for estrogen when it's showing us, you know, the three estrogens and how the body is clearing them and the pathways, you know, when we, especially for females, we get concerned about um, estrogen cancers or estrogen-based cancers. We want to make sure that your body is clearing these things as it should be. And so when we look at things upstream and downstream, we often use an analogy in terms of an overflowing bath uh, concept, right? So if you have a bathtub that is overflowing and you know your drain is clogged and the water is on, what do you do? You're going to keep spilling out, you know, of the bathtub, right? And that water is eventually, as it always does, is going to spread into other places and cause chaos. And so the question that we have to ask is, how do we unclog the drain? How do you turn off that faucet um, and make sure that it's not, you know, just continuing to flood things? We want to get the right stream going there, if you will, um, because there are things that are going to impact how fast you're clearing, as Becca was saying, in terms of thinking about like the analogy of the, the water coming out of the faucet. And so that's where we need to look. We need to get the drain unclogged. We need to get the right level of water into the bathtub and the, the stream matching that flow appropriately. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if we look upstream, which is where a lot of people go wrong, like if you have a doctor or a personal trainer and they're telling you they can just fix all your issues with your thyroid medication or a workout plan, right? Or 
a supplement. <laughs> that happens all the time. This is going to fix everything. Um, it may not be true. And it's most of the time not true and often causing things to go south, right? They, not that they say they get worse, but they can get worse um, depending upon you know where the issue is. So we always want to make sure from a lock and key perspective or that receptor site that we have the ability to get thyroid where it should be appropriately um, and be utilized appropriately. Otherwise, it's getting recirculated and it's causing you know the estrogen dominant scenario as you mentioned. And so there's a lot more to the equation than just looking at your labs here. Even though it looks enticing on the surface to say, okay, my testosterone is low or my progesterone is low, I'm going to supplement you still need to understand what's going on under the hood. Why do I feel like crap? What started this cascade, right? Did I have a trauma or an experience in my life that was like a physical injury or a surgery? Um, could be an emotional trauma for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Just very, very high levels of stress that I could no longer compensate with that cortisol for a period of time. And now everything is to start this downstream effect. Uh, the ball is rolling down the hill and you have no idea where it came from or how to stop it because you're only looking at serum lab work. Yeah. And so, you know, what is upstream and downstream of hormones? How does it get to this point of overflow? You know, I, like Liz was saying, let's start with upstream and I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the HPA axis, um, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. There's also an HPT axis, hypothalamus pituitary thyroid. There's also HPO, hypothalamus pituitary ovary. So our body is basically one big messaging system. It is always talking to each other. And so your hypothalamus obviously is in the brain, receives signals all day long. We talked about like, if you were the cellular um, provider at the Super Bowl, imagine all these different inputs that your body is getting on a day-to-day -day basis, like stress, you know, thoughts, temperatures in the air, you know, people honking on the road. Like there's so many inputs that come in and then it sends information to the pituitary. Pituitary is in direct contact with the brain. There, there is the rest of your body. The hypothalamus is sending relays to the pituitary. Pituitary's job is to produce a lot of different master messaging hormones, okay? So your pituitary creates LH, which is luteinizing hormone, FSH, which is follicle-stimulating hormone. If you are entering menopause or if you've ever tried to get pregnant, you probably know what these hormones are. Um, those go to the ovaries and testes, obviously. Prolactin. TRH, which is thyroid releasing hormone, which then goes to your thyroid to produce TSH. ACTH, which is adrenal based. CRH, which is cortical releasing hormone. So like you have all these master hormones, but here's the problem. When things get overburdened, your pituitary and also your thyroid kind of take the backup. Like these two are the ones that take the brunt of when things become overloaded. And so if another system in your body is failing or not optimal, your pituitary and your thyroid are backups. This is why a lot of times we see adrenal issues when there's chronic stress, chronic input of stress, because your body, your pituitary, that HPA axis is overdrive. Your pituitary is chronically sending signals to your adrenals to be like, pump out more cortisol, pump out more cortisol, pump out more stress hormone. I need to keep up with all of this. It can only do it for so long. And then on the contrary, the other side, the thyroid, your body's like, make more thyroid stimulating. Hey, make more thyroid stimulating until it gets to a place of like, whoa, 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 too much stress stop making so much thyroid stimulating because we need to conserve energy. And again, this is why we often see thyroid issues pop up before hormonal issues. People get diagnosed with hypothyroidism and then they start having, you know, estrogen dominant symptoms. They start having low progesterone, poor sleep, all of these different things. And a lot of people think it's maybe the thyroid that's causing it. In essence, it's this whole system. It's the entire system, that hypothalamus pituitary overdrive, that overburden that starts to happen. And so that is why, you know, your thyroid, your pituitary, these different systems get tired. They are stressed. And in turn, they create symptoms you feel like crap. Yeah. And I think if one wants to kind of feel this or take this into their brain to understand when we talk about, you know, the burnout, they can compensate for a while. Think about if you had a night where you were traveling overnight and you didn't sleep, you could probably compensate the next day because wherever you got to, you were excited, right? Like you're excited to be in Europe or wherever it is. And so you go out and you have a fun day. But if you were asked to do that for days upon days without stimulants, right? I think people do this with stimulants and stuff. I don't know. I've never done it. Um, but days upon days, you you 
you would crash and burn. Eventually you would be falling asleep somewhere like at a table or, you know, lying down, just exhausted. And that's essentially how your body feels because it just never gets a break. You're just cranking and cranking and cranking, expecting it to keep up. And so, you know, I think it's important to also evaluate when was the last time that you kind of got into a restful state and slowed things down, didn't have your phone, did some deep breathing. We're going to talk about, um, you know, that in a few minutes here in terms of detoxification, but when is the last time that you didn't expect yourself to do all the things and you gave yourself a day or two, maybe a weekend where you just chilled? Mm-hmm. Because I don't think most people ever just sit down and chill. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you need to pay attention to to like your body and what it's feeling and when things are shifting and changing. Because a lot of people are like, well, my symptoms seem so random. They're not random. You know, we actually had, I had a client, uh, an old client reach out who's been doing amazing. Um, and she was like, hey, something that I think would be really helpful to talk about on the podcast that I experienced last month was I had been having really good, like she came off birth control when we were working together by her choice. She had really, really healthy, good periods. Um, and she was like, you know, last month was my birthday. I drank more. I ate probably more, you know, out than I should have. My period this next month was the worst I have had ever. And she's like, it's crazy how that, and again, periods take time, like it takes time to reflect that. It's not going to be like you eat like crap three days before your period and you have a bad period. Maybe, but likely not. It's more, I've had a high stress period on the body, whether that is because of overconsumption or other traumas or, you know, events in your life. And then it reflects usually that following month because there are delayed reactions. This is that downstream effect. Hormones are the downstream. So it just helps you see you need to be aware of how you're feeling and what's impacting that. Because a lot of people would be like, weird. I don't know why my period sucks so much this month. Mm-hmm. But in reality, you don't think about, oh, last month I had a bachelorette <laughs> party. I went to that's concert and I ate out way more because I was super busy with work. Yeah. And I think the converse is true. So when we work with women who are getting off of birth control, preparing to come off of birth control, or just had a lot of irregularities, you have to understand it's going to take a few months for your body to get to a better place in terms of like your PMS symptoms improving, maybe less migraines, those types of things. And especially if you're somebody who has had chronic PMS issues, I tell females, and we've talked about this with a couple of the doctors that have been on our podcast, you're looking sometimes six to 12 months. Hopefully Mm -hmm. it's not that long. Um, Usually in about three months, we can see uh, things start to improve in terms of, hey, I didn't have debilitating cramps this month, or I just had a headache instead of a migraine. But, you know, even when someone's doing something like seed cycling, for example, um, you know, to help their cycles, it's not going to be, I seed cycled for a week and my period was (laughs) perfect, right? It's going to be these things that accumulate over time. And so if you're thinking about like, I want these things to get better, you also have to be patient Mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to take time for your body to clear things up and clean things out that have been there accumulating from all of these toxins, endocrine disruptors, right? Xenoestrogens, things like that. So it's the, all these small doses. And I think you shared this on your Instagram the other day, right? The, the bucket, um, oh, the rain barrel effect, yeah. rain barrel effect. Yeah. Right? I actually, Stephen Cabral like termed that, you know, that phrase rain barrel effect. Um, he's brilliant by the way, if you want to listen to his podcast, his podcasts are great. Uh, but the Cabral concept, yeah, the Cabral concept. Um, he does a lot of great Q and A's, uh, but it's kind of this concept of like, you have this rain barrel and all of those little rain droplets don't seem like a whole lot in and of themselves, but when they add up, they get to an overflowing rain barrel, especially if you don't have that lymphatic drainage on the bottom half of it, you know, you don't have those open detox pathways and you don't have that faucet open, letting that rain drain out. Um, you get into this overflow situation. So how do we support that, right? Like this is the downstream. This is, we've talked about the upstream. Usually it's the stress response um, and within that HP axis, but downstream it's usually, okay, how are we actually metabolizing, methylating, getting rid of these hormones through the detoxification process? Because like Liz was saying, once these have been used, once they've been metabolized, you need to excrete them because if you don't, they are going to recirculate into the body in more harmful forms. And that is when we end up with even more so hormonal imbalances because your body's basically just not getting rid of these now toxic substances. Like when estrogen gets recirculated, it becomes toxic estrogen. Mm-hmm. Estrogen in and of itself, I, had, I heard a great analogy that did about estrogen. Estrogen is a very powerful hormone. It can rule a country or it can be a bomb. Like it, you have to decide and work on your lifestyle to help balance that hormone so it's not like the bomb. 
because it can be. Estrogen is extremely potent, um, which is why you got to be careful with that. And again, whereas we look at these pathways, they show us, like Liz was saying, the estrogen pathway that is more aggressive and kind of toxic to the body can drive breast cancer tissue development. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you if know. you guys want a good book too to read, um, Dr. Jolene Brighton, she's got uh, the hormone repair manual. She talks a lot about this in terms of estrogen and the importance of detoxifying estrogen excess estrogen. Um, it's always so hard to say back to back. And so, um, you know, not only going back to the beginning of the podcast, is it important for you to monitor all of these rain droplets that are coming into the bucket? As we've already talked about your toxic, um, exposure, I would add, you know, things that you're taking supplements, medications, right? We've done a whole series on birth control and how, um, that can impact your gut microbiome, create nutritional deficiencies, put stress on the liver. I mean, you guys got to think your liver, yes, people will say that your body is constantly detoxifying and it can do it on its own. And it can, the way that God designed us is to be able to do these things on its own. But we were also designed and created in a way that was not set up for the world that we live in today with all of the chemicals, preservatives, pesticides, everything, right? Um, and so look at your toxic load. And we also want to evaluate how can I better support my body to detoxify properly. So you guys know if you followed us for a while, we've talked about castor oil packs. Those are really great. You can wear them on your liver, also on your ovaries, um, you know, to support PMS if you have PMS issues. We talk a lot about pooping one to three times a day. Poop is waste. It is going to consume those excess uh, hormones and metabolized hormones that we need to excrete. They are set and targeted for elimination in your bowels. So you need to be moving those bowels so they don't get recirculated in the body via the colon. So pooping one to three times a day, good form to number four is what we're going for in terms of the Bristol stool chart. Are you hydrated to be peeing properly? And what do I mean by peeing properly? You don't want your pee to be yellow. Um, you want it to be like this very pale yellow, like a little bit of yellow, but also not super, super clear because if it is, then we're, if it looks like it does going out the way that it does coming in, you've overhydrated yourself. Um, and so then we have to ask all of these other questions in terms of, um, you know, electrolytes and sodium, potassium and things like that. But you can support other ways, lymphatic drainage, dry brushing is really great. I do that. I just keep the dry brush in my shower. I don't technically dry brush because mm -hmm. I'm in the shower, but I, you know, brush. And so you're basically pushing fluid and, um, you know, moving tissue bottom up, uh, in terms of you're starting your ankles, brushing up towards your hips, towards your heart. Um, I'll put my arms up in the air and I'll brush down again, towards my heart. I'll brush up, um, you know, from my belly button area, pelvis area, again, moving all of, um, these fluids towards your heart. You can do lymphatic drainage, uh, massage, very, very simple. Um, the temple, uh, of your skull or the base of your skull here. And then you're looking at your clavicle. I promise you, if you guys start to do these massages, you're going to start salivating and you'll, <sighs> you'll feel like you're swallowing more. But then I want to talk about something else that I think is often overlooked. And that is our vagal tone, vagus nerve stimulation really important, especially when it comes to people who struggle with motility and constantly, um, you know, properly detoxifying. So you can do a couple of things here. You can do the hot cold therapy. So taking, um, 10 seconds at the end of your shower to turn it to cold, even better. You can do a cold plunge or a cold bath. Um, you can do ice on your face. I have a roller that we keep in the freezer. That's awesome. Um, I'll frequently do that just around my eyes. It feels really good as well. Deep, breathing um, and do this through a straw for as long as possible. You can also sing, you can hum, you can alternate nasal breathing. One of the other things that I really, really like is laughing until you cry. So get some friends over, have some, um, you know, card night or um, dinner with them and just spend time with them and you'll laugh until you cry, especially if you're my husband's best friend. Gargling. Um, so you can do this uh, with salt water, you could do it with peppermint oil, but um, just that stimulation on the throat um, and that tone can help. And then the last one here, and this is not my favorite, uh, but gagging yourself <laughs> with your toothbrush. I'm going to prefer the, the humming or the singing. Yeah. I mean, we can, you know, here's the thing, guys, you can get crazy. You can get real crazy with detoxification. Um, you want to be smart with detoxification. I say, I would dare to say that detoxification and liver support is the number one thing I would not DIY. 
I think that you can do a lot of damage and a lot of um, cause a lot of what we call Herx reactions, um, which are basically like unfavorable reactions to detoxification or eradication of things. Um, so if you do suspect that your liver or that detox pathway is kind of clogged, do lifestyle based things, vagal tone stimulation, cruciferous vegetables are great to help bind to these excess mm -hmm. hormones to help excrete them throughout the body, uh, resolving the gut. Absolutely. But do not just like be like, oh, I'm going to take this liver support or I'm going to do a liver detox or on my own or whatever it might be. Um, please, please, please do not do that. So hopefully this helps you understand why we cannot look at hormones in this bubble in this silo. It, they are so interconnected with every other function within the body and they are downstream. Um, and so if you are curious, like, Hey, I wonder if I have hormone imbalance or, you know, I have a lot of symptoms of high testosterone or what we call kind of androgen dominance, oily skin, you know, losing your hair, acne, stuff like that, aggressiveness, irritability, all of those are high androgen levels. So where testosterone actually converts to a more harmful version of DHT. Um, so the Dutch test shows us all of this. The one downfall is that you cannot be on birth control when you get a Dutch test because then you are not actually seeing your hormone levels. Um, you can with HRT because it shows you how you're metabolizing your hormones that you are receiving through HRT. So it has a lot of really cool capabilities um, and actionables with it. So if you are one of those people that's like, oh, I, I feel like maybe that would be beneficial. It is something that we do do with our clients on occasion. Um, I think it can be really helpful to get an eye on, you know, where I'm at with that. So please understand hormones are very complex, but look upstream, look downstream. Am I giving my body the right nutrients, the right things to help create adequate hormones? Because guess what? If you're eating like a bird, your body doesn't have what it needs to create hormones. If you're eating super low fat and no cholesterol, your body doesn't have what it needs to create hormones. Cholesterol is what hormones are created by. Like you think of a horm – we have actually like a pretty cool graphic of hormone cascade. Cholesterol is the top of it because you literally cannot create any of the other 57 hormones without it. You have to be consuming adequate cholesterol and that is, you know, healthy, saturated, unsaturated fats – butter, ghee, red meat, all of those wonderful things, um, avocado, olive oil, and you need to make sure that you are taking care of your body and your stress load because that is the upstream. That is the HPA axis. That is what is going to ultimately affect all of those messenger master hormones that can then go downstream and kind of create some problems. So look at your body, look at your stress, look at your inputs and evaluate where can I start making some positive changes.